Thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and talk over here. And it's not like the other talks. We're back in the UK where we talk about a handful of cases and we don't even get to a thousand. Um, just for those of you um, who don't know, I am a pediatric infectious diseases consultant by trade, uh, but I do most of my work at Public Health England where I am the clinical lead for a number of vaccine preventable infections, and one of them is meningococcal disease. Now, those of you who are on the front line uh, will know the devastating consequences of meningococcal disease and meningitis, and we spend a lot of time trying to prevent these cases as much as we can through awareness, early management. We probably f treat far, many, far more people uh, than there are cases out there just because we're also worried about meningococcal disease. And it's very clear that if we're going to make a difference, then we need to prevent these uh, cases occurring in the first place, and that is most likely through uh, vaccination. So meningococcal disease is caused by Neisseria meningitidis. There are 12 different uh, capsular groups, and four of them are responsible for nearly all the invasive meningococcal infections. And their distribution varies globally, with different capsular groups being more predominant in countries uh, around the world. In Europe and in most of other industrialized countries, uh, capsular group B, or MEN-B, is responsible for the vast majority of infections. And you can see that if you look at the proportion of cases over the last 15 years or so, men bees are counting, and there was a point where it was responsible for almost 90% of all the meningococcal infections in this country. So clearly, if you're going to try target vaccination, then what you really want is a vaccine that will prevent men bee disease. The problem has been that uh, unlike the other capsular groups, such as uh, the men C and the men ACWI conjugate vaccines, um, the capsular group, the polysaccharide on the meningococcal B capsule is very similar to human neural tissue. And the consequence of that is that uh, if you inject it into humans or in animals, it's not very immunogenic because it is seen as a, as a self-antigen. And the other thing is there's been a lot of concern that this may actually trigger autoimmune disease. And there's some animal studies suggesting that you could make autoantibodies if you use antigens that are very similar to self. So nobody really has had the courage to go and develop a, a capsular polysaccharide conjugate vaccine as we have with MEN-C and MEN-ACWY. And really, it's taken 20 years in a very novel technology known as reverse vaccinology to try and identify the major antigens on the surface of the meningococcal uh, capsule and then use those uh, to make a very unique protein-based vaccine. This vaccine, Bexero, is probably one of the biggest and most exciting recent advances in vaccinology because it is a broad meningococcal vaccine uh, that should target all meningococcal groups, even though it is licensed for the use uh, for, for um, prevention of men B disease. And this vaccine is unique. It is like no other vaccine that we have out there because it takes a, a number of very important protein antigens on the surface of meningococci uh, adds in a bit of the outer membrane vesicle, which is basically makes the vaccine dirty and very, very immunogenic. Um, and uh, basically uh, vaccinating uh, humans with this va uh, vaccine induces antibodies against all the antigens and some of the dirty antigens in the outer membrane vesicle. Now, as I said, it's like no other vaccine that we have. And to get it licensed, they've had to develop some very complex uh, laboratory assays to determine whether this would prevent disease in uh, invasive disease in humans without having to do effectiveness studies. So one of the ways that they did that is that they match the antigen in the vaccine uh, with a strain that has the same vaccine antigen and then they use the antibodies from vaccinated individuals to see if it will kill that strain. So these are strain specific antibodies and you can have uh, basically, you can have four antigens um, that uh, would react in the system, and the proportion of strains that uh, would be killed by the antibodies from this vaccine can be determined in different countries. So for England and Wales, for example, we estimate that about 75% of the meningococcal strains have these particular antigens which would 
make them uh, susceptible to the antibodies in the vaccine. So about three quarters of all our men B cases could be prevented with this vaccine. Does that make sense? It's a really complicated way. There are no effectiveness trials. You just have to assume that if the antibodies uh, from the vaccine kill the strains, then they would prevent the infection occurring. So this would be excellent news for the UK, where we know that up to 90% of oral meningococcal infections are due to men B. But there is a problem. It took them 20 years to develop this vaccine. They started in the 1990s when men B was responsible for 90% of all the infections. By the time they licensed the vaccine, we're somewhere down there. And we think this is just natural secular trends for meningococcal disease, but men B disease has been following. The orange bars are the men C uh, cases, and the men C vaccine came in in 1999, and you can see it's virtually disappeared. The dark bars are men B cases, and you can see that they've gone from something like 1,700 cases in England and Wales all the way down to just over 600 cases of uh, men B disease in England and Wales. The number of cases have fallen, and there's no indication that these cases were going to go up again, even though at some point we expect it would because it's such a cyclical uh, illness. To make matters even more uh, difficult is that the very age groups that you'd want to target for vaccinations are the ones that were hit the most in terms of this reduction in men B disease. So you can see in under ones, for example, the number of cases went from over 200 down to 100, and in toddlers, it went from 275 cases down to 120 cases. And again, no indication that this is slowing down. So if you use this as a, uh, to predict what's going to happen, you'd expect that the cases would continue to go down, which makes it very difficult to bring in a national vaccine program. To confound that, the, the, uh, the amount of um, public awareness and even awareness among the healthcare professions with the 1990s men C outbreaks and, and uh, at the same time a huge upsurge in men B disease in the 90s, we as clinicians have become very, very obsessed with meningococcal disease. We are very, very fast at recognizing this condition and starting antibiotics early. And we know that clearly we are, we are identifying them much quicker and we are treating a lot more cases very quickly compared to before. And if you look at case fatality rates for men B disease, for example, over, uh, over the six year period, you can see that in infants and in toddlers, for example, they were, this is not 162, by the way. It's, uh, so these 162 cases, five deaths, three deaths, two deaths. You can see that the case fatality is very, very low, especially in children. We've become very good at uh, reducing uh, deaths and even long-term morbidity associated with the disease. But at the same time, it was very clear that this is a really, really important vaccine. And one of the key factors is that it is, it is cyclical. And the, the, uh, when you have large, large epidemics of meningococcal disease, and we just don't know when the next one is going to come along. Uh, the men's C outbreak in the late 1990s, as some of you may remember, actually it was sitting on top of two different men B strains that had come out at the same time. So there were three really nasty circulating strains in the 90s uh, that were responsible for this large number of cases that we identified. And that was unpredictable. It just came in and then it burned itself out and the chances are it will come back in again. So that's a good reason to have a vaccine program to protect them against any future uh, upsurges in disease. And no matter how low the number of cases are, it is, meningococcal disease is still by far the most important cause of bacterial meningitis in the UK. So if you look at the study that we did over here, looking at the proportion of confirmed bacterial meningitis in the different age groups, meningococcal disease is responsible for 50% of all bacterial meningitis in children, uh, even now, and causes a substantial amount of disease in, in adults as well. So the JCVI um, deliberated on all the data available. There were multiple cost-effectiveness models that were uh, developed with inputs from all different parameters to try and see if there was any way we could optimize the model to give us some sort of uh, indication whether this vaccine would come in. And in the end, it, it took two years since the vaccine was licensed to come up with a model that suggested that it is possible that we could bring in a men B vaccine at a reduced schedule uh, if the vaccine could be um, 
brought in at, can be um, acquired at a cost-effective price. Now, the price of the vaccine is around £75 if you go to buy it. And uh, you need four doses in babies and two doses in adults. So it's a very, very expensive vaccine. The cost-effectiveness model suggests that it could be cost-effectiveness at about £6 per dose. But the negotiations took place, and in March 2015, uh, an agreement was made, so nobody knows about the price of the vaccine and the agreement that was made, but the vaccine was uh, uh, procured and acquired, and a, uh, and a plan was made for the vaccine to be, uh, the program to start on the 1st of September. And it was a very small program because we did not have a large catch-up cohort because of the cost of the program and the vaccine. So what we did is offer the vaccine to uh, all newborns from the 1st of July. So they got the vaccine at two months, four months, and 12 months, along with their routine vaccinations. And the small catch-up of those who were coming in for their three-month and four-month doses anyways, they would receive the MenB vaccine when they came in for their routine vaccinations. And the reason to try uh, and justify this uh, process was that if you look at the number of men B cases by age from zero to 24 years, the biggest burden of uh, disease is in the first year of life. So if you're going to target a vaccine program, you want to try and target the group that has the most number of cases. And within that, if you look at the, uh, the age distribution in the first two years of life, you can see that we get men B cases from birth and they go up to about five months and then slowly trickle down. So if you're going to bring in a vaccine program, you want to bring it in earlier rather than later, which is why we opted for the two and four month schedule. And this vaccine is very, very uh, immunogenic in that it makes antibodies, uh, very high amounts of antibodies against the antigens in the vaccine. So these are the four antigens that are included in the vaccine. Uh, if you look at the proportion of uh, subjects with bactericidal antibodies, they start with nothing. But then after, after the primary uh, schedule, this is a three-dose three schedule, two, three, four months, the vast majority are protected with, against at least one and most likely two of the vaccine antigens. And pre-boosted, the antibodies fall at 12 months, but then they boost really well as well, which is what we would expect with most of the vaccines. The problem we had was that a, a three-dose priming schedule was never going to be cost-effective because the vaccine is so expensive. And we had to use, we had to try and get data, whatever data we could, to try and see whether we might be able to reduce the schedule to a two plus one schedule, which would make the vaccine program 25% effect uh, cheaper straight away. And there was a study that did take place where they had, they had a two, four, six month schedule, but they did a blood test after a two and four month dose. And what you can see is that the proportion of uh, children who developed antibodies after a two-dose schedule is really not too bad compared to a two-four-six schedule or a two-three-four-month schedule. So that even, you don't make, even though you don't make a lot of antibodies, the proportion of children who develop protective antibodies against these antigens was pretty good. So as a consequence of that, uh, ideally, even though we would have liked a three-dose priming schedule, which is what the vaccine is licensed for, we opted for a two-dose schedule uh, which would allow us to, uh, to develop a cost-effectiveness model that actually was um, reasonable and allowed the vaccine to come in. The amount of antibodies is not as high as three-dose uh, three schedules, but it's not so bad, actually, and the vast majority of infants should be protected. The catch-up program was really a very pragmatic approach. There are no data for the three, four-month schedule for those who come in early or at the single dose of four months. But the logic is that it will offer some protection and therefore protect them against a, a disease during a period when they're most at risk. And also it will prime them so that when they come to their 12-month schedule, they'll actually get a booster response rather than receiving the first dose at 12 months. The, one of the key problems that we had with Bexero, which uh, was a bit of a concern both by the pharmaceutical company and by, uh, by public health doctors, is that this is a very reactogenic vaccine. If you don't put in an outer membrane vesicle into the vaccine, the OMV bit, 
then the antigens are very good, but it, it's not very immunogenic. It makes a little bit of antibody, and that's it. When you put in the OMV bit, which is the dirty capsule, a bit like acellular pertussis and whole cell pertussis, you get an amazing immune response, but that comes at a, at a price of being a, a very reactogenic vaccine. And one of the biggest worries was that up to 50 to 60% of those who received Bexera with the routine vaccinations developed fever. And fever in a baby is always worrying because they automatically, according to NICE guidelines, should receive a full septic screen with cultures and lumbar punctures and so on. And it's not just a, a fever. When, when these two vac when bacteria is given with the routine vaccines, they, the kids are miserable. They cry a lot more. They sleep less. They have a bit more vomiting, a bit of diarrhea. And you can see everything is a little bit more with the dark blue bands. But it's really the fever that is remarkable because the chances of fever are more than doubled when they have it with their routine vaccines. <laughs> But what was quite nice about it is that it was a very predictable fever. So you could predict that the peak fever would be within six hours of the vaccine being given. Uh, nearly all the um, nearly all the fever is uh, sort of between uh, is at the lower end with some between 39 and 40. And after 24 hours, it settled down. And after 48 hours, you shouldn't have any fever at all. The issue that we had at the time is this whole concept is, well, if they have fever, can we use antipyretics to try and either prevent this fever um, or how would we recommend treating the fever after vaccination? And one of the things that uh, was clear is that the work done a few years before and uh, the NICE guidelines uh, uh, on the management of feverish children that was published first in 2007 and then in 2013, uh, made it very clear that antipyretics do not prevent febrile convulsions, which is a worry for all parents and healthcare professionals. To be honest, two-month-olds and four-month-olds don't get febrile convulsions. Febrile convulsions occur after six months of age, but the fear of having a high fever that could lead to a fit is, was a worry. And the recommendation, according to the NICE guidelines, is that you should only give paracetamol to make them feel better and not to treat the fever. So if they have a fever and they're miserable, then you give them paracetamol and it'll make them feel better. Do not keep chasing the fever. From the vaccinologist's point of view, the timing was really unfortunate because in, uh, in 2010, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there was a paper published in the Lancet that suggested that if you give paracetamol at the time of vaccination, you can reduce the fever and other symptoms associated with vaccination, but you could compromise the antibody responses to a lot of the vaccine antigens. And because of that, NICE and, and even the JCVI uh, recommended that routine administration of prophylactic paracetamol at the time of vaccination was not recommended because it could compromise your vaccine response. The, um, what was quite lucky is the same authors who published the first paper did another study looking at paracetamol prophylaxis with Bexero given with routine vaccination. Uh, this, the first column is a no paracetamol prophylaxis, and this is paracetamol prophylaxis. And you can see that the, person, the, the proportion of infants who developed fever after vaccination was over 40% if they didn't have paracetamol, but this came down to about 13% if they had paracetamol. So they showed very clearly that if you give paracetamol at the time of vaccination, then your risk of fever is reduced essentially to background rates, but not to zero. But that's what you would expect with most other vaccines. And at 40, 24, 48, and 72 hours, there really wasn't that much difference. It was a six hour that was critical. And what they showed, which was quite a, a relief, is that the antibody responses to any of the vaccine antigens were not impaired by paracetamol. Um, so we don't actually know what to do with that information. There is no biological plausibility as to why paracetamol should reduce vaccine antibody responses. Um, but what is clear is that even in the studies where there was a reduction in vaccine antibody responses, it wasn't enough to stop you getting protected. So protection was never impaired. So you make a bit of less antibody, perhaps, 
for some of the schedules and some of the vaccines and some of the combinations. But the vast majority of infants, even when they get paracetamol, developed protective antibodies. So what we're clear on is that even if you give paracetamol and even if there's a little bit of a less immune response, it's not enough to put you at risk of infection. It just reduces the amount of antibody that you make, which is reassuring for us. Um, and there's a really nice systematic review published in 2014. And you'll never find this on, on PubMed. I, I don't know how they've managed to, um, to categorize this systematic review, but when we did full searches and we never picked it up until like a day before we were going to publish our guidelines. But there it was, there was a systematic review that looked at the use of antipyretics in reducing adverse reactions and antibody responses in children. The perfect thing that we were trying to answer. And it shows very, very clearly that paracetamol in all the studies that were tested significantly reduced not only fever in these infants, but pain, swelling and redness at the injection site, irritability, drowsiness, persistent crying. Everything that is associated with bad bits of vaccines were reduced with prophylactic paracetamol. This is paracetamol given at the time of vaccination. It's not the same as treating. Treatment is a completely different question. Yeah? What was really interesting when we, were doing, when, when, look, when we were looking at the literature is that ibuprofen prophylactically does not reduce any of the symptoms. And that doesn't make sense because ibuprofen is an anti-inflammatory. If anything's going to work, you'd expect the ibuprofen to work. But this is a really nice study where they actually did a head-to-head uh, a study looking at Prevnar 13, or, uh, the pneumococcal vaccine, with the routine DTP vaccines. And what they showed is if you just give the vaccine, then 41% of infants developed fever between 38 and 39%. If you give, um, if you give three doses of, uh, sorry, paracetamol given three times with the first dose given at the time of vaccination, the rate of fever are down to 18%. If you give ibuprofen three times a day at the same schedule, there's hardly any effect on fever after vaccination. So prophylactic ibuprofen doesn't work the same as paracetamol. Um, and this is what we have to recommend because that's what the data shows. That's what the systematic review reported, funnily enough. But we're not sure why that is. What was even more useful with this study is if you give two doses of paracetamol instead of three doses of paracetamol, you lose this effect on fever. And this is clear indication that if you want to prevent fever after vaccination, you have to give the first dose at the time of vaccination. I mean, around the time, a little bit before, a little bit after. If you give it more than two, after, two hours after vaccination, then there's very little impact in reducing fever. So it is really working as a prevention of fever rather than treatment of fever. And as a consequence of that, we have recommended that paracetamol should be given with Bexero vaccination at two and four months, with the first dose given at, um, at the time of vaccination, and then two further doses at six-hour intervals. And this is the first time we've recommended uh, antipyretics with vaccination. And that actually was much harder to implement than the whole of the vaccine program. What was one of the, one of the uh, very interesting things that came out of one of the clinical trials that was done is, is parental knowledge uh, and attitudes. And we did a lot of work on this, but actually the best information came out of this clinical trial. So we know that Bexero causes fever. The question is that what are you going to do about the fevers? You can ask them to take paracetamol and so on. What this particular clinical trial did is that they had, an, they had a blind arm and an open arm. In the open arm, they told the parents, this vaccine will cause fever in your child. Give them a bit of paracetamol, take off their clothes and keep them cool, and don't worry. If it's more than 24 hours, then seek advice along those lines. And what they showed quite nicely is that the medical attendance rate in those uh, who had no information was 5% compared to 2.8% for routine vaccinations. But when the parents were told, 
about the fever, the medical attendance rate was 1.4% compared to 1.8%. And what you could do is just bring it down to background rates if you educate the families about the risks of fever. 5% with uh, 600,000 babies being vaccinated twice in the first year of life is a lot of babies coming to A&E and the GPs. And that really worried us. So we did a lot of, um, we've done a lot of advertising with healthcare professionals, with, with the media, with NHS choices, internet, Twitter, and so on. And we used every possible means that we had to try and get the message across that you need to have paracetamol at home. We were putting them in the bounty packs. We were leaving leaflets in the maternity rooms uh, just to get across the idea that you need to have paracetamol at the time of your second two-month vaccines. And we also had a fallback mechanism that for the first six months or so of the program, if, they turn, if parents turned up with their baby and they don't have any paracetamol and they can't get paracetamol on the way home, we offered them sashes of paracetamol until they, everybody got used to the idea of having paracetamol at home. So how has it gone so far? Remarkably, very, very few glitches, uh, which, is, which is amazing because we were expecting quite... Uh, uh, we were expecting that there might, we were, we thought there might be a lot of problems, especially in relation to the reactogenicity of the vaccines. We were less concerned about parents having a problem with the vaccine because in general we knew that parents will take a vaccine against meningitis because it is better to have fever than to have meningitis. And that was very clear with all the work that we did um, with our um, uh, through, the, uh, through the work that we do through public health where we actually pull the, the, the parents, new parents, and so on. We found that um, most of the kids got the vaccine without any problems. We think that the catch-up cohort wasn't brilliant in that there's not all GPs managed to call everybody who was born before the program, but those who were due the two and four months got it really well. Uh, there were issues around families being very upset because if you're born on the 30th of April instead of the 1st of April, you don't get the vaccine. Uh, we had some genuine uh, parents who were uh, upset because they were born on the 5th of May, but they were called for their vaccine at 8 weeks, 12 weeks, and 16 weeks, not at 1 month, 2 months, and 3 months. So on the 1st of September, they had already had their vaccine and therefore would not be called back for the MenB vaccine because the plan was that recalling would be very expensive. You give it to them when they come for their routine vaccination. But they were very minor. It was a very small group of uh, uh, complaints, if you want to call it that. Um, there were issues in terms of the paracetamol and that you know, some nurses were happy to give the paracetamol, some nurses were not willing to even hand out the sachets because it's a drug. Um, sometimes the parents gave the paracetamol before coming to clinic, some parents could not get it because um, they, they, weren't, they didn't live anywhere near a supermarket. There was this whole issue that we, when we tended, we got Calpol and many parents did not know that Calpol is paracetamol and others wanted to know why we're giving Calpol and not any other local paracetamol brand. But generally, uh, these were minor issues and we no longer, they've sort of, uh, we, they've been weeded out. And the biggest problem we have now is really the neonatal units are still not comfortable giving the vaccines because of the premature babies. And the idea that if they get fevers and become unwell, then you couldn't just leave them and you'd have to treat them and do the lumbar puncture and septic screen. So we're working on that slowly, but I think we're getting there. The vaccine was very well, to, uh, uh, the uptake was amazing. We anticipate that the uptake of this vaccine will be 90 plus percent because it's just part of the routine vaccines. And therefore, it will just fit in and children will go and have the vaccines and come out and it won't be an issue. This concern about fever, there are anecdotal reports. There's, there is every pediatrician out there will tell you of somebody who knows somebody who took their kid in for because they had fever. In general, if you think about Bex Zero, and when the kid comes in and the baby is two months old, you can ask them and you can sort it out. If you don't think about Bex Zero, they get a full septic screen, they end up in the ward, and nobody thinks of Bex Zero, so we never find out. 
Um, but when we've looked at large hospitals to try and see if there are more blood tests, blood cultures being done, or more lumbar punctures being done by month of uh, age of these kids in September, October, November, December, we can't really find a signal to suggest that these kids are getting loads and loads of investigations which they weren't before. And you have to remember that kids do get fever and they did come to any before the vaccine started. What you're looking at is how many more are coming in because of Bex zero. So if you know about it and you keep asking it, you'll find the odd one. But what you don't know is maybe last year they would have come just after the MNC vaccine. Uh, we monitor uh, the MHRA, gets all the yellow card reports, and it's only about 40 reports of fever, which is nothing. And we monitor GP attendances and NHS 101 and A&E attendances. And the data are quite new, but this, there is no signal that we should be worried. I'm supposed to be talking for an hour. That's a really long time. Um, I'm now halfway through my talk, and I'm surprising I'm actually on time. Can I suggest that if you have any question on the Men B program, that I try and answer them now, and then I'll talk to you about the Men W program, which is shorter and won't take as long. Would that be okay? Do you, does anybody have any questions for the Men B program? Thank you. Um, Simon Cathcart, I work in health protection in, in public health with Public Health England. Um, implementing a new vaccine um, is always difficult and we get lots of questions and concerns from, from both the public and from GPs. Um, one of the aspects that we're involved with when we get a case of um, meningococcal infection is around the contacts um, and giving chemoprophylaxis and also vaccination. And it seems clear with the, the men, if a men B strain is isolated, we're not giving the vaccine to contacts. Is that uh, a purely a cost issue, or are there other... They didn't, they didn't think so, but there so, are implications around that. Yeah. Okay, so, so the, they, there's a logic to... Uh, uh, they, there is a logic, and there's a science behind it. The logic is that if it was like a MenC vaccine or an ACWY vaccine, then um, we would have no problems recommended, because there are only 100 kids out there. It's not like it's a huge number anyways, considering how many we're vaccinating. The issue is that, one... Secondary cases among contacts of a single case are extremely, extremely, extremely rare. You'd have to vaccinate thousands of contacts to prevent a case. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the vast, the, the biggest risk associated with the secondary case is mitigated by antibiotic chemoprophylaxis. The additional benefit from a MenB vaccine actually is probably even tinier than that. The third problem is that this is not a conjugate vaccine. This doesn't work within seven days. If it's a baby, so the highest risk of secondary cases are the youngest ones. The youngest ones may need up to four doses of vaccine. One dose almost certainly doesn't work. You definitely need at least two doses. So then it completely changes what you do out there in, uh, on the front line because you then have to vaccinate these babies two, maybe three times, two months apart or one month apart. So you're giving them a four-month or a six-month schedule for an event that happened very early on with the risk virtually disappearing by the time you finish the vaccine program. And also, if you're going to get a secondary case, it's going to be within three weeks of the first case. And by that time, that vaccine dose is not going to work. So when you start taking into account these sort of uh, uh, these data and try and put a number about you know how many you would need to vaccinate, you'd be talking about having to vaccinate upwards of ten thousand to prevent a single case, and it just doesn't make sense to offer this vaccine because we don't know enough about it. Uh, because it's a waste. It's not because there is an issue with it. It's just that it doesn't make sense to do it at this stage. What we do say, oh, there's one more thing. We don't know if it prevents carriage. The whole point about C and ACWY is when you vaccinate the, the close contacts, you are eliminating transmission within that because either the baby or the, the case got it from somewhere or the case gave it to someone. By using a conjugate vaccine, you remove all carriage within that uh, close contact population and therefore you reduce transmission in that environment where the risk is high. Bexero probably doesn't, and if it does, it's very, very little effect on carriage. 
So the benefit again is lost. And how long you're protected, we don't know because there are no data on how long the antibodies last for. So at the moment, we don't have information. What we do say is if you have two men B cases, and if you don't know whether it's protected, by, if, if the vaccine will protect against the strain, we don't care. Because once you have two cases, the risk of a third case goes up a lot. So in case of an outbreak or a cluster, use the vaccine and use it properly, because that's probably where it's going to have its most effect. Did you consider uh, using or giving the first day, dose prenatally, just as they give it in countries with a lot of oh. uh, neonatal tetanus? Oh, you've, this is, the, you're talking about the new world. This is, <laughs> this is where it's all going. I think, I think in the future, um, all vaccines will be given uh, in pregnancy. That's the way things are going. There is a big issue with maternal vaccinate. So, so the big thing in vaccinology is antenatal vaccination. Okay, if we could, we would move all our vaccines to antenatal vaccines. It never makes sense to start at, at two months. Um, the issue is that it is very contentious because there are, there, are, there are perceived risks of vaccinating in pregnancy. So the pharmaceutical company is not very keen to, to license vaccines for during pregnancy, and parents are not very keen to have the vaccine during pregnancy. What about giving it in the third trimester? They, it, until recently, it would not have been a feasible option. They just would not take a vaccine. It's natural. We don't do unnatural things to pregnant women. And that, was, and that has been going on for at least 20, 30 years. We're fighting that battle. What has changed the landscape is two really key events, well, three key events. The first one is the swine flu epidemic, where a pregnant women were encouraged to take the flu vaccine, and we managed to get 60% uptake in, the, uh, in pregnant women, which was totally unanticipated, but the pregnant women realized that the vaccine will protect them and their babies. That was the first time a, a pregnancy vaccine was uh, considered to be acceptable. This was also helped, in, is perhaps the wrong word, by the, by the, the, the pertussis outbreak that we had and we now have a very good, probably world first, state of the art maternal pertussis vaccine program. And we can show very clearly that antenatal vaccination with a pertussis vaccine will prevent infant uh, pertussis and deaths. And that is now becoming routine. The third thing that will change the landscape is the group B strep vaccine, which is now undergoing trials. Once the group B strep vaccine is licensed and becomes a routine part of maternal vaccination, I think it will open the door for all the other vaccines to come in. Thank you. Okay, so that's okay. So I'm going to talk for the next 10 minutes or so about the men W outbreak, and then you can ask me any questions, including the men B questions you might have. So I'm moving on a bit. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that the Beck Zero vaccine is licensed as a MenB vaccine. The reason it's licensed as a MenB vaccine is because of apples and pears. The MenB vaccine is made of protein antigens on the surface of the vaccine. If they wanted to call it an ABCWY vaccine, then they would have to demonstrate non-inferiority to the ACWY vaccine. But the ACWY vaccine is made of the capsular polysaccharide and it makes antibodies against those sugar capsules. This vaccine makes antibodies against the proteins. And therefore, you can't compare in terms of immunogenicity uh, whether one is non-inferior to the other because you just can't measure that effect. So they have to be, it has to be licensed as an ACWY, as a MenB vaccine, but it should protect against all the meningococcal groups that have the surface antigens on it. So there's no reason why it shouldn't protect against C, W, and Y. And there's a lot of research going into that field at the moment. But it's not quick enough for the problem that we've had with men W disease. Can I, can I just ask, um, how many of you are aware of the men W outbreak in the UK at the moment? Ah, fantastic. Okay, hopefully everybody will from now on, because it's really, really scary. Um, 
For those of you who may remember, meningococcal group W accounted for like two or three percent of all the meningococcal cases in the UK. And just before, um, just before I didn't go very far back because then this wouldn't look as impressive. But if you went back a little bit to the early 2000s and 2001, we had a blip of men W cases, and that was because of the pilgrimage to the Hajj, and they got, they got the men W from there, brought it home, and either they got men W disease or their family members, including the kids in the house, got men W disease, and it was nasty because it was a really nasty W strain. But um, Saudi Arabia then introduced mandatory ACWI vaccination for all travelers, and that epidemic literally disappeared within a couple of years. The W strain actually went and it became endemic in many countries around the world from the Hajj outbreak. South Africa had hundreds and thousands of, of people being infected with the W strain, and it's now part of their routine problem. It, it is one of their main capsular groups causing disease in South Africa. Latin America had the same problem with WW now become, became really big. And in Chile, uh, up to half the cases were W. Um, it just settled in and it liked where it was and that's where it became a problem. The UK never had the issue. None of the European countries had a problem. France saw a little bit of cases uh, recently of W and they panicked, but all their cases had come from sub-Saharan Africa where they had caught W and brought it back home rather than it being endemic. But what we noticed in 2009-10 is a small increase in men W cases, and these are age groups. And you can see that most of the increase were in the older adults, and then sort of more adults, and then a little bit in children. But not enough to worry. You're still talking about 30 to 40 cases. Big deal. And then we went up a bit, and then went up a bit, and then started doubling. So by the 2014-15, we had almost 180 cases of men W compared to what we were used to, which was 30. And this increase was being seen in all the age groups um, compared to before. And you can see that even though the biggest increases, these are the last five epidemiological years, the biggest increases in the older adults and in the younger older adults. Um, it was virtually in every age group, and in particular in teenagers and in infants and toddlers, where we hardly saw any cases. But we also started noticing that they were dying of men W disease, which is really uncommon, because generally men W affects those with comorbidities um, and is not that fatal. The background W, this new W strain was nasty. And when we tried to do some uh, simple um, uh, phenotyping of the strains of W disease, we noticed that nearly all the new men W's were of a particular strain belonging to type 2A. Uh, type 2A is a marker for uh, clonal complex 11, the CC11 strain, which is, which is the engine of the men C outbreak that we had in the 90s. So it's just got the same nasty engine of men C that we saw before. It's just changed its capsule to a W. And it was spreading like wildfire because none of our cases had actually traveled to a country where there was a lot of men W, suggesting that these men W cases are endemic within the UK and the strains are circulating in carriage in the UK and causing, causing disease locally. And um, the boffins up at the MRU do a lot of fancy work and make these graphs and I struggle to understand, but it makes me feel really important. Um, but essentially what they do is you, you, they, they do a lot of genome sequencing of these strains and, um, and the red dots are basically individual strains and then they can package them to try and see where these strains have come from. And our first worry was, is this the Hajj outbreak, which is what we're worried about? Um, and uh, why has it come back? But when you start sort of just slotting them all together, what you notice is that these are the Anglo-French Mali strains over here, for example. This is the North African strains over here. This is the Burkina Faso W strains. These are other South African ones, the odd UK ones, suggesting that these cases, look, there's three there in 96, two in 97. They probably came from that area over there. But what was really interesting is that the UK strain was not from the Hajj, it actually came from South America. 
And what had happened is that whatever strain was from the Hajj that had gone to the Americas and had settled there and became endemic there, somebody at some point brought a South American strain into the UK, and that strain has now become established in, uh, in, um, uh, in England at least, and probably in the other nations as well. So in 2012-ish, we started following up every case of meningococcal W disease to try and understand the disease a bit more because we only had 30 cases before, but now we're reaching sort of in the hundreds. And there are a couple of really key important factors that we can't make um, emphasize enough. One of them is, look, none of them traveled. These are endemic W strains here. These are not, these are not travel-associated C or random strains. The second thing is that virtually all of them are healthy. So if you look at the risk factors in terms of any risk factors, it's very, very low. And even when you look at comorbidities that you get with the older adults, it's not that much. This is affecting healthy people. And what is really interesting, which I don't know how, we, how much of this message is out there, is that the non-B and non-C, so the W and Y strains, are more likely to give you very atypical presentations compared to the B and C strains. And with W and Y, you get pneumonia, you get septic arthritis, and you get epiglottitis and supraglottitis. And the thing is, nobody thinks about meningo because they don't always come with the typical rash. And what happens is they come in, they can't breathe, they get antibiotics, two days later you get MenW and you go, oh, or a septic arthritis. I mean, you know, who would think of meningococcal disease in a swollen joint? And so we sit on these kids, they have their joint aspirations done, and then two days later we find W. And then the public health action start, which we're already two days late. And given that 75% occur within the first five days or so, we may actually miss an opportunity to miss secondary cases. Um, but it's important, and it's not only just the elderly, where they do get a lot more pneumonia, but you know, adults get, you know, a quarter of uh, healthy adults had uh, presented with pneumonia. There's septic arthritis in virtually every age group, as there is epiglottitis. And it's important to try and keep that in mind, that sometimes we do get it, and if there is a chance that it is meningo, then it should be notified earlier rather than later. Probably what's even scarier, though, so this is just showing that 37% ended up in ICU. So this is, not, this is not a mild illness. What is really worrying is that in the last year, um, so since July to December in the last year, we've had 14 teenage cases of meningococcal W. Of these, six have died. That's a case fatality of 40%. That is not far off the men's C cases that we were seeing. And what is really unusual is that they don't come in with meningitis and septicemia. A lot of them come in with vomiting and, and diarrhea. And that seems to be a new thing that we did see when, uh, even a year ago, we noticed that there were the odd cases of healthy young adults saying, oh, I've, I must have eaten something, started vomiting, had a bit of diarrhea, and then found dead in their rooms last year, two years ago. But what we've noticed is that we've had two recent deaths. Both of them came to A&E. Both of them had vomiting and diarrhea. Both of them were kept in a side room because they had diarrhea, and they didn't last 30 minutes. Um, and it's because we don't think of meningococcal disease. And these this gastrointestinal symptoms seem to be a really prominent feature with these new MenW strains. So everybody on the front line, if you could just pass it on, that if you see anything like this, you know, young adults generally don't get bad vomiting and diarrhea. If it's bad vomiting and diarrhea, just think of um, an alternate diagnosis. So we started getting worried about this in uh, late 2014 because the cases kept going up. And we thought we need a strategy. The problem is that unlike all the other tropical diseases you hear about, we had 85 cases at the time in a year in all age groups. It wasn't going to, uh, it's, it's not going to force anybody to start a vaccine program for 85 cases. And the other thing is that it was across all age groups and half of them were in the older adults. So we are not going to be able to vaccinate everybody to try and reduce the disease burden. Um, in Chile, they had a similar problem, and they decided to vaccinate their infants and toddlers. 
three, four years ago. And what they showed is that they could control the disease in infants and toddlers, but all the other age groups went up, especially the teenagers, because of the high carriage rate in teenagers. So the only logical thing that we could think of is that if we target teenagers who have pretty nasty disease, we could provide direct protection to them. And if we target the age group with the highest carriage rate, which is, happens to be sort of 17 to 21, then what we could do is reduce carriage and transmission to others so we would not only protect the teenagers, we would protect the rest of the population. A bit like what we did with Men C, but instead of going from zero to 18 years, we just focus on the high carriage lot. And in the beginning, that was thought to be a good idea. And the plan was that the teenage Men C dose, which was started in 2013, uh, would change to ACWY when we next tender for the vaccine. Unfortunately, these cases kept going up and up and up, and they doubled again, and we started getting really nervous about a year ago, and we thought this is going to take too long. And so what we did is that we, uh, uh, the recommendation was then that we are going to introduce a very rapid catch-up program as an emergency outbreak response. And over the next two years, I'll come to that in a second. Over the next two years, we will target everybody from the age of 13 to 18 in different batches. Now, don't forget that uh, this is, uh, every birth cohort is about 600,000. If you're gonna do for 13 to 18, that's five birth cohorts, that's three million doses of vaccine. Nobody has three million doses of vaccine. They couldn't even make it if we asked them. And so it took us six months to acquire an international emergency stock of 250,000 or so doses. And so we had to develop a prioritization system where we can vaccinate the most at risk and then work our way down while we tended for two possible vaccines. And what we did is we targeted the year 13s who were going to university because they are 15 times more likely to get meningococcal disease compared to their non-university peers. So we started off with year 13. We changed the routine year 10 vaccine to, uh, from men -ACY to men C to ACWY. And over the next couple of years, we will vaccinate different age groups so that uh, by 2018-19, we will have targeted five years of uh, uh, teenagers who will then have moved, sorry, who will have moved into the age where they should be high carriers. So that by 2018-19, everybody going to university will, be, will have been vaccinated with the MNACWY vaccine. That's the plan. Um, the, the, uh, there are two vaccines. There's Menvio and Nymanrix, which we like because it gives us two sources. They're both very, very immunogenic and they reduce carrot. They prevent acquisition of carrot. So, uh, if you vaccinate enough people, and we think 30% is fantastic, and then you can actually reduce transmission uh, and, and induce herd immunity, but that will take a, a few years. We also have a program for freshers, so new university entrants would be eligible for the vaccine. Um, and then slowly we would replace all the others, and it should become a routine teenage vaccine in the next three or four years. One of, the, one of the added benefits that we were able to show is that um, the antibodies made by Bexero in babies actually uh, killed this emerging strain because this strain had some of the antigens in the vaccine. So we feel a bit better that even though we don't have an infant program to protect the babies against MenW, the Bexero program should protect them against this nasty strain. And again, we've done a lot of advertising. There's a lot of um, tweets and um, uh, uh, I've even lost the words for them, but um, the, the comms and the media teams have been working very hard to make sure the message is out there. There's a lot of emails, the NHS so Choices websites where uh, parents are written to about meningitis. It goes into the UCAS forms about getting their vaccine before they get uh, to the um, to university to tell them that they need to protect themselves. And these are hot of the press data, basically looking at uh, meningococcal disease, meningococcal W disease by age group. And it's for the last six months only. So every year is comparable. And what you can see is that in the 15 to 19 year olds, for the first time, 
we have seen a reduction in the number of cases compared to previous years, but all the other age groups are still going up. So these are still small numbers of cases, but the background is still shooting up. And that's quite worrying because it will still take a few years before the, um, the herd immunity effect uh, takes place. And one of the reasons is uh, that we think we've achieved very, very low coverage with our vaccine program because it started so suddenly. And uh, the decision was made in uh, February. The vaccines were acquired in July. The first program started in August to protect them. By the time they go to uni in September, it was just too fast. So our, our coverage has not been as good as we would have liked. But hopefully over the next few years, as we go to more school-based programs, we'll get 80, 90% uh, coverage and that will help push the disease rates down. So just to summarize, um, we have introduced two major programs in the UK to target all capsular groups of meningococcal disease. We're the first country to introduce Spexero. No other country has introduced or is even thinking about introducing the vaccine because it is very, very expensive um, and it is still an, a big unknown because its effectiveness in a population has not been demonstrated. The licensure was done looking at immunogenicity of the vaccines. It's a lot of post-marketing surveillance going on in terms of effectiveness, impact, and adverse reactions. Generally, it is very well accepted because parents will take a vaccine against meningitis, even if it has side effects. And we think that the MenB program is going to achieve high coverage and should protect against around 75% of all cases in infants. Uh, but we need to monitor that. The ACWY we know is going to be difficult to implement be simply because of the target age group that we're uh, hoping to vaccinate, but uh, we can only try our best. There's a whole load of information out there if you're interested. There's a lot of training materials out there. There's a lot of training slides. If you Google Meningo and gov.uk, the pages and pages come up. We have an enhanced surveillance program. We have uh, information about what to do with samples, what to do with cases, uh, what we are doing to uh, study the effectiveness of the vaccine, how we are collecting the data. Um, it's all on the website. Thank you. <laughs>